helps um it's on right now there we are hello audience um so welcome to um our first talk uh for this exhibition colonial swag um both are titled queer visibility coloniality and april bay's art um i want to thank you all for being here this evening i want to thank the speakers i'll introduce them to you quickly from that end going this way so peter a a bailey Associate Professor of English Studies at University of the Bahamas. Um, Craig A. Smith, everybody's an A, lots of A's. Associate Professor of English Studies. And Keisha Oliver, Assistant Professor and Head of Department of Visual Arts and Design at University of the Bahamas. And I'm Amanda Coulson, the founding director, um, along with Lauren Perez of TURN. And this was organized by our lovely Jody Minnis, who's in the back making everything work. Um, and we're here to, again to just talk about uh, queer visibility and coloniality in these works around us. So I hope you all had time to see the show. It's really, really beautiful. I love coming in every day because I get to see all the lovely people um, every day. And we're going to start off hearing from Peter A. A. Bailey. So I'm going to pass the mic over to you. So okay, I'll just walk. I'll just walk. Good exercise. Thanks. All right. So this may take a few minutes. Uh, I'm just going to read and then, you know, each of us will present a few words before we actually talk together about this. So April Bay's work uh, does at least two things, right? The first thing, it exposes the colonial origins of that ideology that warps how we see queer sexuality in the Bahamas. And second, it provides a counter image of flourishing, right? That which she calls colonial swag uh, to contest the ways in which we see sexual minorities. So I would say that it's difficult to see queer people clearly in the Bahamas. They are either invisible, underrepresented, misrepresented, or ironically, blindingly hypervisible whether they be transgender, agender, non-binary, gay, lesbian, bisexual, whatever you want to call them. And there are many reasons for these representational difficulties, but much of this queer invisibility occurs because of the violent legacies of imperialism and colonialism, you know, the imposition of one people's authority over another people. So consider just one example of this legacy and what I'm talking about when I say blindness. It's very common to read an international discourse of the Caribbean, and this includes the Bahamas here, is the most homophobic region on earth, with the possible exception of Africa, right? Um, if you're trying to get asylum in Canada or Europe, one of the most successful ways to reinforce, uh, to get it is to reinforce that narrative, speaking only of a population of sexual minorities that is ashamed, miserable, in hiding, uh, fearful for your life, fearful for safety, and yet not ignoring the very real difficulties of what it means to be uh, queer. In the Bahamas, 
this story erases the queer subject for it does not imagine any Bahamian possibilities or realities of queer thriving, queer safety, queer visibility. Queer Bahamianness, like what does that mean? And so there's a pessimistic narrative. That pessimistic narrative has to be repeated because it confirms what the colonial powers knew then and what they insist that they know now, which is that down there in the colonies, still the colonies, they really are all savages, right? Um, we have to rescue them from themselves. And that's one example of this kind of uh, lack of visibility or blindness that I think exists. There are other ones that we might be able to talk about. So what does April do with that? I think one of the things that she does, uh, if we look over that tapestry there, that one called, you told Harpo to beat me, um, is of course an image of Queen Elizabeth II. And I think this kind of iconic image that we see here encapsulates one of the ways in which she responds to this idea of queer invisibility. The portrait is from the first official photo session that uh, Queen Elizabeth does after she accedes to the throne. It's from a set called the Dorothy Wilding set. And those images are the first that circulate globally of the new queen. They're the, the first official portraits. They get sent to government houses. They get sent to um, embassies. And they go on the postage. And so it's a kind of iconic image that um, is very easily recognizable and confirms kind of British dominance over uh, British subjects, you know. As I say here, uh, she's easily recognizable, part of a visual economy in which British subjects consume these images always and are recalling uh, the fact that they are colonial subjects. And that same root uh, these same global roots through which that image circulates is the same roots through which the ideology comes down that kind of makes queer subjects invisible, right? It's all coming from England. So I think even in an interview, April talks about the fact that these images of the queen, one of them or the other, were banners in her classroom in school, and they would say Pledge of Allegiance to these. She was terrorized by these images as a child because of the queen looking and thinking that whenever she did something wrong, that you know the queen was looking at her and was aware. And that type of surveillance is really, you know, how the the people's bodies are policed. So during the colonial period. British colonies generally followed the same laws that Britain had. And so you have 1861 um, Offenses Against the Person Act, which is the kind of basis for a lot of the sodomy laws in the Caribbean. And so, you know, like Jamaica's law that they still have now is based on that law. A lot of the Anglophone Caribbean colony laws that you have are that law. So you can make a very real argument that a lot of the colonial um, homophobia that exists today is as a direct result of this kind of outflow and, you know, the same paths of ideology, the same paths that these images flow through. So one of the things that we would have to ask is what exactly does uh, April Bay do to that image. And I find that one especially quite fascinating, this one with these stripes that come down across uh, Her Majesty's face there. It's as if she's been put behind bars, right? Um, I think April's response immediately is, if under a colonial area, right, we're pointing to queers and saying, you are criminal and you know, sexual intimacy becomes criminalized. 
April turns that around and says, it's not us or it's not the colonial, it's not colonial queers that are criminals, but the monarchy, uh, she tries to put that back in its place. And so it's interesting to look at both of those images and see these kind of uh, images of incarceration. But even beyond that, when you look at the materiality of these images, what they're made out of, um, she talks about the fact that these are African wax prints, or not even exactly the cloth is, you know, if you look at it, um, a reminiscent of that cloth that you would see in Africa. And I'm interested in that, in that it, it's not only that she seems to imprison the monarch, but she seems to Africanize her or creolize her or transform her. Like, what does that mean to take these um, materials in order to make this image? Okay. Um, all of these artworks seem very much to be about reclaiming a certain type of power. And we can see that just from the name alone, right? If this portrait in the back here is called You Told Harper to Beat Me. Anybody who is a fan of the color purple will recognize that speech that comes out, or Oprah comes out and starts talking about, you know, you know I'll kill him dead if he, if he touches me. So that picture becomes about a certain type of resistance, right, instead of uh, a certain type of subjection. And in the use of this African wax print, which has very complicated origins, right? Wax print originally comes from Indonesia and the Dutch go to Indonesia and they see the wax prints and they decide that they want to commodify them um, by mass producing them. So they actually take the process back to Europe mass produce the fabrics and then try to sell them in Indonesia and the Indonesians won't buy them because it's not authentic. And so they have to find a market for it and the market that they do find for it is in Africa. So you have West Africans that are buying colonial products um, and that are re-signifying them. Like if you think of African wax print now, it, it's a kind of signifier for African pride or Afrocentric pride, but it doesn't have those origins. And it seems to me that that relationship to the cloth, whereby here is something that's not really um, all that desirable, but something that we take over and make our own image is exactly the response that April is kind of saying uh, we would have to have towards a negative image. This queen, I think, made out of these African wax prints as being re-signified or made to have a new type of meaning. So that's just what I want to put out there to start. I'm sure we'll say other things, but just bear in mind this idea that before she liberates us to think about the possibilities, it seems as if she's trying to think about, well, what do we do with this colonial baggage first? Like, what do we do with it before we can dream in other ways? Now for something totally different. <laughs> uh, hey, um, so um, I want to first start off by thanking Amanda for um, having us here. We spoke um, leading up to this, right? Um, I had come in because uh, I have my students visit um, different locations around the Bahamas or around Nassau um, for one of their assignments. And one of the assignments um, with the show that they had prior to this one, um, I had my students uh, attend and I spoke to Amanda about my students coming and we were talking about it and why it's important. And then we started talking about other things. And then she started talking about the fact that this show was coming. And you know, uh, one of the things that struck me at that time was how necessary and important a show like this is for us, and also why it might be um, 
a good idea to have the University of the Bahamas take part in that conversation as well. At the time, I wasn't really planning on being on the panel, but here we are. <laughs> so, um, you know, because again, one, and this is coming, as I was talking to her, I was thinking about one of the assignments that I um, give to my students. Um, and that is, and it's connected to this, um, in terms of queer visibility and queer representation in Bahamian art. And so one of the films that I show um, in one of my classes is Kareem Mortimer's Children of God. And so I don't know how many of you know that film or what that film is about, but it's about this um, interracial queer um, um, or gay relationship um, set here in the Bahamas. I believe it may have been the first film to actually represent, have that type of representation, right? Um, and so I remember on several different occasions assigning the film and explaining to the students what the film was about prior to them seeing the film. And so, you know, and you had students who refused to watch the film because the film is about um, two queer Bahamian men. And so this is the sort of environment in which, you know, this work is being um, represented. And so um, in terms of Bahamian people in general um, facing um, other queer Bahamians or the representation, I think um, it's really important for us to begin to have those conversations publicly, right? Not just behind closed doors either. And so um, I mentioned Kareem Audemars' film because again, I think that that's one of the first um, artistic endeavors we have that represent um, queer identity in the Bahamas unashamedly, I guess, in some ways. Uh, but of course, uh, in that film, it ends tragically. I, I'm not sure I want to give it away for folks, right? And so what tends to happen a lot in representation of queer identity, and even in terms of that film, someone starting off not really connecting with that, and then coming to themselves, and then the end, it's tragic, right? And so those are the kind of discourses we have around queer representation and queer identity. Uh, the Another interesting project that represented somewhat queer identity, I think, and I can't remember the name of the photo exhibit. At N, yeah, at the NEGB, NE8, yes, the, the, the photo, the photo series with Dash and Jones, yes, Alan Jones and, and Rashad, right? And so that was another sort of bold step, I thought, in terms of public representation of queer identity um, in the Bahamas. And what I thought about that, and again, trying to really think through what, how this speaks to me um, in relation to those things. Um, in those photographs, um, they were nudes, um, tastefully done, you don't see nothing, right? <laughs> but also in those, um, the faces were covered, right? Um, I don't think that any of them, I may, you may see a side face at one, right? So even in the representation of, um, in these photographs, where you see um, two men embracing each other in a particular way, um, the way that the photos are taken, their faces are hidden. And I thought that that was interesting in terms of what does that say, even though that we're talking about this positive representation, um, there is, I don't know, that may be um, a decision in the part of the artist to protect the models, maybe the models themselves to protect themselves, I'm not sure. But, you know, we can talk about what that might mean. Um, but what I found interesting with this, um, I think is really different than any of the representations I've seen before, in that if we look at each of these images, the... Um, subjects look you directly in the eyes, right? And I think that that says something about maybe where we're moving towards and where we are now in terms of representation, in terms of identity, and the fact that these are all younger Bahamians, I guess, under, <laughs> let's say under 25, under 40, yeah? Right. 
And so I think that what Bay is capturing here too is this sort of, um, this movement, this, this coming into a new sense of self, a new sense of identity, and a new sense of pride as well. Um, and so again, even as we look around the room, even with this one where um, the face is turned away, they're still, again, not hiding in shame, right? And so I see um, in the vibrant colors in terms of the glitter and the feathers and everything else, I see that there is a sort of shift in the way that um, queer black bodies in particular um, have been represented um, even within this space in terms of this maybe even a defiance we can say right in that idea of looking directly forward looking at whoever's looking at them returning the gaze in a in a certain way I also was interested in you know, what Peter was talking about in terms of this idea of the behind bars and the idea of the queen and that representation of the um, colonists behind bars. And what it made me think about is, and again, in terms of how it's set up in the room and the defiance of these figures, these black figures, and her being set in the center here, in particular, and even here, um, for some reason, it put me in the, so it's a long, long thing. So I thought about this. You told Harpo to beat me, going back to Alice Walker, thinking about In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. I don't know, just free association. And somehow it led me back to Sarah Bartman, right? Um, the hot and Todd Venus, right? In terms of the way that this African woman was um, sort of thingified, objectified, behind bars, under the European gaze. And so here we almost have a sort of reverse of that in terms of where she is centered, where she is set here within this space, and the fact that we have her surrounded Right, and sort of maybe even flipping that narrative in a particular way in terms of thinking about, um, and when we think about the Hunt Talk when we think about Sarah Bartman and what has come out of that in terms of representation of black bodies and black sexuality um, in general, and what does it mean then to turn that gaze on that? And like you were saying, like now you're in the gaze. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now you are in the cage, right? Now are you, you are the thing that is outside. And so um, that's one of the things that, um, again, for me, I thought was really interesting in terms of the representation and just the idea of the, um, the joy and the defiance in the ways in which these uh, models are posted um, in these images that I think are very different than the types of representations that we've seen before, where there may be sort of apologetic, maybe there's been fear, maybe there is this sort of anxiousness. And I just don't see that in these um, images at all. And I thought that that was really interesting, very powerful, and very powerful, again, thinking back to, bringing back to my students, and thinking about how a lot of Bahamians aren't able to articulate um, themselves when they are dealing with issues of identity and how then this might be um, something that helps them to see themselves and again in the in the idea of young behemoths and I know a couple of them are entertainers as well and so I think that that even brings it to another level where we can think about um, how that's represented all right so I'll stop there for now Well, I wish I could be as fluid, but I need to follow in the <laughs> in the steps of um, Peter. So gender fluidity has really appeared as a subject um, in world art for centuries. And so when we look in the past 50 years, we can see that the arts has held a unique position in really shaping, continuing off of what you're saying, this kind of evolution of how we um, view queerness in a, from a social perspective. Um, in really looking at how not only queerness, but underrepresented underrepresented groups since 1969, you know, that pivotal moment with the Stonewall riots and how that was a catalyst for the gay rights movement. So looking at arts and the power of arts, the positioning of the arts to do this, to have this moment is something that we really need to think deeply about. Now, it's really difficult when we want to pinpoint 
black queer visibility you know finding that minutia that timeline that moment is really difficult for us particularly in our region um but in the past 20 years i think you've made reference to visibility at the NEs, which is something that was a really a first for us here in the Bahamas. Um, we see the practices, we see the creatives, we see the spaces becoming a little bit more open, a little bit more accepting, a little bit more aware um, of the importance of acknowledging this visibility. And so the, the concept of Caribbean queer visuality, I think it came about in about 2014, it was a symposium that was held um, at Yale University, and it then birthed this exhibition in 2017. I think it was curated by um, David Scott, Erica James, and one other curator. And it really brought together Caribbean artists um, from this same sort of kind of generation. You talk about the, the evolution of how we are a little bit more open. So we think about the age group of those artists. We're looking at a Kareem Mortimer. We're looking at a Ebony Patterson. And so that generation has become unapologetic. They are they are intolerant of this kind of voice of oppression. And so they want to be this voice of newness. And so really now thinking about the contemporary, before we can get to the contemporary kind of space, that decolonial space, we really need to think about what preceded. So modernity, we need to think about Bahamian modernism um, specifically. And we can't just abandon or not really consider the moment that existed for those artists because they themselves were the pioneers. When we think about the 50s, the 60s, that was the really the formation, the establishment of art education. So if we think about what they were enduring and what was coinciding as far as civil rights movement, um, majority rule, coming a little bit later, but still preceding that moment, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of racial tension. So to really be, I think, advocates and really be in this space was probably a little bit ambitious, I think, for that time and that period. Um, so evolution, I think, and thinking about it and realizing the importance of how those pioneers, the Bahamian modernists, paved the way for the contemporaries is really important part of the, the narrative. And so when we look at the period of modernism, looking at the 50s and 60s, we can see an existence of queer curiosity. It is not as evident. It is not as um, bold as these statements, but you see it. You can see it in some of the artist's work. You can see it in, and you can hear it in some of the oral histories, but it is, you can see that it was silenced. You can see that there was this kind of shadowing, as it were. And so the generations, and you mentioned Kareem Autumnore in film, but the generations that followed, like Jeffrey Maris in his performance art, um, April Baynow in her visual art, um, and then Kareem Autumnore in, in film, we see the shift this definition of Caribbean art in the, con the contemporary context and how they are unbothered by this kind of socio-political, the pressures, they are taking a stance, they're taking a position and they are not afraid. Like you say, these subjects, the muses, they are looking at you. They're not looking away. And, and that's very important when we think about how for so long these voices have been marginalized, how they've been silenced and how they've been oppressed. And so the material aesthetic, and I know, Peter, you mentioned it, it's really important when you look at the tangibility of the work, because it has a lot to do with what we, what we see has a lot to do with how we process our understanding of the concept. And so the material aesthetic and the visual tone of April's work um, really gives the viewer much to contemplate in the power of this theme of Afrofuturism. Now I know we sit here thinking, Man, these just works of art on the wall. But this concept of Afrofuturism really allows the viewer to, particularly her Black audiences, particularly our audiences from the diaspora, they allow us to dream. They allow us to think of ourselves beyond this reality. For many, that is one of oppression, that is one of frustration, and allow us for that moment while we're looking at the works to feel empowered. And that right there is something that she has done in a beautiful way. And it kind of mirrors the cultural phenomenon. I know years back when Black Panther came out, everyone was like so excited. But it's a very similar kind of feeling. It's a very similar phenomenon 
what she's doing here because it's in your face, but it's not a radical, aggressive, assertive moment, but it's still present. And I think these representations also speak to her appreciation and her processes of working as it relates to fashion. And um, we mentioned um, materiality and we talked about, I know we both, you both talked about the, the use of fur, glitter, et cetera, and how they are associated with queer culture, with queer fashion specifically. And she purposefully, intentionally uses these. She uses these in a way to kind of subvert that kind of negative uh, context on what it means to be queer. Because when we are in this space, when we're thinking about this work, this work is set in the tone and in the imaginary space of what she calls Atlantica. And so we have to get into that mindset and thinking that this is not for now, this is not for our space, this is not for our time and our existence, this is for something that is intangible. And within that, it becomes very magical and it becomes very real as far as what can be for many people because it's something that that could be us that could that can happen if you see it if you understand what you're seeing and so for me the distinction of visibility um it's a really kind of it's a question that we really need to think about visibility in degrees of visibility because i think there's a difference between being present and then there's a difference between really being represented. There's also a difference between um, voicing your concerns, being an activist, and a difference between being present. And these degrees of visibility, too, speak to the reality of the queer community, the queer individual, and what they have to endure, how they have to present or represent themselves or how they are presented or represented. So I think those things are things that we may want to talk about um, and how this artwork speaks to that and how April has allowed the individuals in this work to be seen because otherwise they may not have been seen. They may not have been represented. They may have been present but not represented. And so that is what I really want to talk about. One question I do have, and I don't know if we're going to have time for this, but really is to talk about the way in which April has framed the kind of context, and maybe it's a curatorial statement, around what colonial swag is. And she references it as a luxury brand. And for me, there's a certain exclusivity to that. So I really want to talk about how Okay, okay, so I don't wanna <laughs> preempt, but that's one of the questions I have in how, yeah, that frames, so. I can answer that. One of the great things about Atlantica, for those of you that don't know, um, April is from another planet. So she's from a planet called Atlantica. And on Atlantica, there's no racism and no sexism and no texturism and no colorism and none of that nonsense. And one of the beautiful things about Atlantica is that glitter is currency. So that means the luxury brand is affordable to everybody. So it's not about exclusivity. It's about creating beauty, creating excess, creating fabulousness, but that is actually accessible to everybody. So um, Atlantica's, oh, take my mask off. Okay, sorry, I just don't want to spit on the microphone. Um, I'll keep it, if I keep it out here, are we okay? I've got a booming voice. Just didn't want to breathe all over the mic. So yeah, so glitter is currency. So everyone's always, everyone's always got some because we all know you go to the Junk New Shack and you've got it in your hair for like 15 weeks afterwards. And, uh, and it also speaks to something else which I wanted to pick up, which was the idea of value, of, of turning um, the idea of value on its head. And that's not just the valuing of individuals, obviously, but things like, you know, the way she's decorated the tapestries with the hair beads and the hair beads are contrasted with this extraordinary wealth of Queen Elizabeth and her diamonds and her pearls. So it's really speaking about, you know, um, that we can give things value and we can find beauty in things. And so the sequins, the fur, and, uh, and so that, that's something that's very important too, as about, um, how we look at things. This particular piece behind us is called guest genes, mind the business that pays you. And of course that means, you know, pay attention to the things that feed you, that nourish you. 
um, don't just, uh, you know, work, don't get caught in the trap of the Prada handbag or whatever. So it's really turning all of those ideas of value and worth on their head. I think something else that um, Peter's book, to which I think you, I loved when you, you sent that essay yesterday and I read it and I thought it was so interesting because um, uh, this idea of the idea of, of we always have to write stories of trauma. And I think um, it's something very real and that it's what I love about April's work is that she's creating a vision of joy and a, and a way to exist where the trauma, and you know, we all know that life's not going to be easy for many people. I have a trans son. I have a, a lesbian daughter in the Bahamas. We all know how that is. But um, to have stories that give you a, a path of hope to look to. And, um, and I think that was something I spoke to my daughter about a lot because it, it happened a lot, I think, also in um, stories of blackness that very often there's this idea of like you have, to, you have to tell these stories of suffering to get the empathy, right? We need to change the world so everyone's got to understand whether, you know, you're Irish uh, Protestants or whatever it is. We have to show these stories of suffering to, to make the world understand in order to get the empathy we need in order to evolve. Okay, I get that. But at the same time, then you're constantly being shown um, images of sadness and images of trauma. And so the first thing that when my son came to, out to me was that I had a nightmare that he was raped in a bar that night. And I, and I sat with that and I reflected on it. And I was like, because I haven't been given, uh, especially in this community, um, the, the, the idea that a different life could be had. And so I think that's what's really important about April's work, and that's why I love it, because it's setting up this idea that um, there that we can thrive. And I think specifically to your point, Peter, too, which I loved, is that I think we've been sort of, in so many ways, um, about so many things in the world, we've all been sort of brainwashed about, you know, what happiness is. And this idea that, yes, the Bahamas is this terrible place where you have to suffer, and if you want to be queer, you can't be out, is actually not entirely true, right? And um, as I have friends coming here from other Caribbean spaces, they think the Bahamas is like super advanced, right? And that's not to deny, again, so we, I think it's interesting how we have to find this balance of acknowledging reality, but also still creating stories of hope and of joy and of, of freedom, right? And so I think that's really important and to, and to acknowledge that, um, yeah, that that can exist. And, uh, and I think, like you said, all these people, so these are all, I think I should also say these are all actual people we know. We did an open call in the gallery um, for members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, they came here. We had a shoot. Uh, so these are all people that April knows, that engages with. April works very equitably. So everybody who um, is in the artwork uh, gets a print so they can also participate in her own um, because, you know, there's these problems also of exchange and value. Like one person did ask April, well, you're selling, you know, this work is expensive. How do you feel about being part of that sort of capitalist system? So she really tries to think about equity in the work, um, sourcing materials that are either black owned businesses, women owned businesses, um, sustainable businesses. Uh, so that's very important to her. Um, and what else do I want to say before I pass the mic back to you guys? The queen, I think, is really, really interesting because you're right that she's behind bars. Um, but it's not just kind of, and I think this is also what I love about April's work. You mentioned sort of, you know, a sort of a aggressiveness and, um, uh, you know, her work is loving. And she even, God bless her, has empathy for the queen because the queen is in prison, but she's not in a kind of, a revenge fantasy prison where she's like in Robin Island being, you know, she's, she's in this gilded cage, right? So her cage is, she's also imprisoned. And April acknowledges that, that at that age where she is, she was, her honeymoon was disrupted, um, which, you know, and, and her life has been completely organized for her. And even though she's the top of the heap and she absolutely um, benefits from the system that's in place, she is as much as we all are imprisoned by the system. And I think that April is able to um, hold those two thoughts at once is really important. That she, um, again, it's joy, it's love, it's empathy, and it's finding a, a beautiful way forward. And I think that's what makes it so, so powerful. Why I love to come to work every day and look at it. <laughs> 
Who wants the mic? Yes, that's right. Yeah, no, you're right about that. Um, all of what everyone has said is quite interesting. I don't even know where to begin with that. The degrees of visibility, I thought, was an interesting point because one of the things that was interesting to me about this is we talk about queer visibility, and yet as m there is the question of what exactly that is, right? One of the things that I was thinking about is just like you, I mean, I know many of these people, some of my students or friends, um, I knew about the open call. So I had a context to understand the images of people that are queer and that have chosen to be represented that way but images travel outside of context. And so if you're seeing these images outside of the context, how do you know that they're queer images? Which is always, I think, a question about queer visibility. Who is it for? Visible to whom? Because I can imagine somebody walking in and hearing me talk about, oh, you know, invisible queers. And it's like, invisible to whom? I, I know, <laughs> like, not to me. Like, I, I know who they are. And so there is that question of um, what does it mean to be queer and what does it mean to have that, to be visible in ways that are not just kind of very material and pornographic, right? Which is the only confirmation. Um, this is somewhat important. I mean, we just come off a weekend about a, a whole thing of outing and social media, some of you might know, a young man um, exposed uh, his identity and, and the idea that having yourself exposed in that way can be tremendously damaging, right, in a community. And so maybe not everybody wants to be represented, right? Um, but all of that, I think, is, is something we, always, we also have to think about. So what exactly is queer visibility? What does April have to do in order to make queers visible? I mean, I, I found it very interesting, um, all the things that are going on, the excess, the, the glitter, right? Seeming to say, just in formalist terms, one of the things that I'm going to do is to say that um, queer visibility is about the condition of being seen, right? There's all this light that's in these images, all the glitter that's there, but not just even the sequins that are the bars for um, Queen Elizabeth's enclosure, the bright colors, but not just um, kind of this light and, and the texture that the light brings, but as we've talked about, the fur and just the, the fact that I mean, when I walked in and saw this about three weeks ago, I was just like, I want to touch every, <laughs> everything, right? It's, it's not enough to just say that we are here visually, but there's also a tactile sense. There's a, like a kind of, it, it's not just visibility, but presence, right? That she renders in certain ways. And I found that also fascinating about it. That it's, it's not just, you know, we can be seen, but we can be experienced. So I thought that was something to think about. Um, so a couple of things. I just um, wanted to talk um, something that Amanda talked about in terms of the narratives that are continually produced um, that are, again, we talked about children of God that tend to be traumatic. And so what happens is um, many of you probably have um, listened to Chimamanda Adichie's The Danger of a Single Story. And so the idea that these are the um, stories and narratives that people tell about themselves over and over again, or other people tell about whoever who thinks that they are producing something that gains empathy and understanding, right? But what it may often do is re-traumatize or just have people believe that this is the only narrative, this is the only experience, right? And so in order to be in the world, they must um, set themselves up to be traumatized over and over again. And so this is why I think work like this is, again, important because it um, sort of troubles that narrative, right? Um, it troubles the narrative that 
the Caribbean space is so homophobic that um, queer people dare not show their face. And here we see, you know, close-ups directly, you know, uh, again, in terms of that representation. So I think that that's really um, necessary and important for us to um, really consider um, and, you know, produce more of this kind of work um, so that we do have some, because again, the, trauma does happen and it happens, still happens, and we can't lose those stories, but it's about balance, right? And you talked about, I think you talked about Black Panther, right? And so what, why that was so important is again, so we're presenting, and, and again, if we're talking about Afrofuturism and this idea of a Black or Afro experience outside of colonization, you know, you have Wakanda that um, sets up um, a society that might, some might argue, might be like Atlantica, right, <laughs> in certain ways. Um, and so um, the more, as, as we represent um, different stories about blackness, right, because again, in the US, the films that came out, Boys in the Hood and Menace to Society and blah, 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 right, the same narrative over and over again. And so, or the slavery narratives, like if I watch another film about slavery, right, they're important, right? But that's not all there is to the experience. And so by providing um, another sort of representation, it's really helpful in terms of how people can see themselves and conceive of their lives moving forward. Um, in terms of thinking about, again, the idea of Atlantic and the idea of Afrofuturism and thinking about why that is so important for us to engage in as well. I think Peter talked about it earlier and you did as well. The, no the notion of, in a lot of sci-fi um, literature films, you know, more times than not, you don't see black bodies. Um, when you do see them, they may be one in the background. They don't take center stage. And so the idea of um, becoming a part of, or taking ownership of this idea of Afrofuturism is really important to imagine yourselves in the future, not just black, not just Caribbean, but queer as well. Again, it's really important for people to be able to um, conceive of a future where they belong. Um, and not as supporting characters as well, but as sort of um, main characters, if you will. And so um, in all these ways, I think that's really important for us to think about this kind of work and producing more of this kind of work. Uh, yeah. Um, so I think uh, a part of what I was talking about is, as it relates to the degrees of visibility, um, you continue to kind of, you know, build on that discussion as it relates to space. And I think as we all sit here willingly in this space, I hope willingly, <laughs> um, we're here because we are interested in the subject matter, right? And it's a safe space. And so I think the visibility and the notion of the visibility is very different than if it was in a space that wasn't curated for this conversation. And I think more conversations or more instances like that, these may be social experiments where the work is moved and you say there are prints of them and they may become more public displays of queer visibility and how the public reacts to that. Because like I said, for me, these images aren't, um, they aren't outrageous, they aren't overwhelming, they aren't aggressive. And it would be very interesting to see how they are received, right, in that manner, in that stage of visibility. Because I can see very well, I think April speaks to this being like a campaign, Colonial Swag being a campaign. And I think, you know, looking at the notion of advertising and thinking about the actuality in the the moments we live in, how if these were to be put on a billboard or put within a space outside of the context of the gallery that's a safe space, how they would be received. I'm interested in that because I look particularly at the images over there to the right, they looks like, like they could easily be promoting some, I don't know, some retail store, some bon vivant, something, you know, it, it does not at all look to be a threat. And so, it's amazing how at this point, in this moment, in 2022, that can be the case. But 
not in the 50s, not in the 60s, right? And so I think the context is really important in, in that regard. But the possibilities of how works like this can move forward in being social activism to see how the public can react to this type, this form of artwork engaging with the subject of queer visibility. So one of the things that um, you talked about the idea of a threat, and then Peter also talked about the idea of um, these pieces. And one of the things in terms of what they look like, like what the, what the subject matter is, and in terms of when we think about Oftentimes when we think about queer representation in art and photography, like the um, um, photo image of any nine, Alan Jones. Alan Jones, right, right. So, you know, the idea of what may seem threatening about that is the nudity and the closeness of these two men, right? And so I thought that this was really interesting going back to the idea of what makes these queer? Right, because I've been here a couple of times, and one of the times I came with someone, and you know, I was like, "Yeah, this is what this is about." This is queer representation, like, "Oh, well, how how do you know?" Right? How do you know they're queer? Right? And again, I think that that's really important as well uh, in terms of what does what does it mean? What do you think about when you think queer or queer representation or queer bodies, right? And how does how do these then maybe disrupt that idea that you might have, even in terms of when we think about art that represents queerness or queer identity? Um, again, a lot of times it may be nudes, par partial nudes, it may involve touching, but here you have individuals, right? Just looking at you dressed, fully dressed and so on. And so again, I don't know, you know, what, where we can take that, but the idea that this is, again, for many people looking in a mirror, right? There, there are no quote unquote markers of queerness that we can see. Right, and so when you are, I don't want to make a stereotype, some random Bahamian coming in and who don't want to come to the turn because they are showing these queer images, right? And then you come in and you're confronted with this, then what does that do? How does that destabilize the ideas that you have about who is queer or what queerness is or what it looks like? Because you know we all have our ideas of what that supposed, what that means to us based on, again, the single narrative that we've been getting throughout, right? And so when you're confronted with this, oh, they look normal, right? Um, how far does that go in terms of maybe helping us to maybe re-educate or help us to rethink about how we um, sort of compartmentalize certain ideas about who people are and what an identity, what it means if you identify in a particular kind of way? <laughs> um, yeah, for me, that's part of that's part of the that's part of the very interesting thing behind this. Because for me, it's a kind of stumbling block and a, a rough place. The confrontational images, where we see two men kissing or whatever. I think put things in, in your face in a way that you cannot ignore and you have to process, which is interesting, right? Because I think that the other form of invisibility in Bahamian society, so I talk about one, but another form is the idea of the open secret, right? So Bahamians have a deep, maybe other people do too, but Bahamians have a deep investment in notions of privacy, and kind of, and you know, the spectacle and so forth, and this idea that you know that you're gay, I know that you're gay, where neither of us are going to acknowledge it, and that will be the condition under which we will permit you to survive. Right. And when you say, but isn't that terribly, um, restrictive, whatever, they'll say, no, it's respectable, or no, it's about privacy. Why, do, why does it need to be in my face? I know that it's there, and you just go to your way and do what you need to do, so long as I don't have to see it or I don't have to witness it, although I know that it's true, and that is okay. And I feel like a lot of structures in our society 
depend on that type of disavowal, which is, I know very well such and such, but let's not acknowledge it. Or, you know, we even have, if you do any type of queer work in history, it's, it's always funny because you can have all the accounts of how um, two men shared a life, they shared a house, they li you know, they slept in the same bed and, and all of this. And people will say, oh, but they're just good friends, <laughs> right? As long as that hardcore evidence is not there, there's something that I can I can say there's no proof of that, and so let's overlook it. And so when it comes to even queer work like this, which is queer in certain ways, but doesn't necessarily have that, like I said, that pornographic trace, I think there is always something in there for people to say, oh, well, it's not bad because that's not what it is. I don't have to think about it in that way. So when, you're, when your friend comes in and says, well, what's queer about it? <laughs> I feel like that is the kind of protective move that many people will move to, right? In the same way that, you know, you can have all these signs about loved ones in your life. Um, you know, somebody's 40 and they're not married and they're not looking for good. And it's all the things that are lined up neatly. And people will say, oh, but that's, I, there's no proof of that. I don't see that that's there. So, uh i'm like i said before i'm very interested in in context and we talked you just said about what would happen if these moved out of the gallery into another space or like i was saying before what happens when we don't have amanda here to explain um april's mythology um then i think that people will say oh well they're they're pretty pictures right but a lot of it becomes um, loss. Like, I mean, just looking behind you, prominent, the, the imagery of the hands that is there. Now that must have a private meaning. It's something that's there and we see it repeated over and over again. But if you don't have the key to it, then, you know, I feel that it is the essence of what's queer about this work, a part of it. But if you don't have that thing to unlock it, then is it there? So that is my own, and it's not a reservation because I think maybe that's part of the point, right? I mean, even when, you know, you don't come out once, you come out over and over again and, and you, you say it over and you're not visible once and you have to say it over and over again and it's not one and done. Maybe that's part of that work, that there's a constant labor to say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And you can't just have it you know, well, we did that photo once, or we said that I said I was gay once. <laughs> like, isn't that enough? Um, I wonder a little bit about that too, and the, the conditions of this. I want to say one quick thing. As you spoke about, you know, what really defines queer art, are we saying that the queer art or what is deemed typically to be queer art is defined by intimacy or the visibility of intimacy? Is that, what, is that the only indicator? Because then that changes, that changes a lot about how, what is expected, right? What is, you know, what, like you said, someone can come in this space and not understand what they're looking at without knowing the context, without reading the artist or curatorial statement. But I think for me, knowing a little bit about what queer art is, it's just the representation of queerness and is queerness necessarily the act of intimacy only solely defined as that? So. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't, think, I don't think that's what it is. I don't think that's what it is. And I think that, you know, in the same way that queer is not just about your intimate sexual acts, it's about a whole nimbus of other things. I mean, it's your fantasies, it's how you dress, it's your style, it's it's all of those things. Um, it should extend beyond that, but I don't think that for everyone like when when it boils down and you have to come down and say it, it it always seems to come to be a speech act either someone declares this to be so and so we know it's so right the performative queer i'm queer so okay now we know you've come out or i saw that 
which falls under what I know to be queer. And so that confirms it. But um, part of the work I think queer artists do is to get away from that representational stuff, right? I mean, you could have queer work without bodies. You could have queer work without faces or figures. Um, and certainly there are queer styles, but a lot of it, so much of it falls under things like, I know it when I see it. Like you, you how do you explain it or talk about it? Um, I think it sounded like someone in the audience had something to say. So we should probably. <laughs> 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 okay, cool. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ava. Um, so I really liked uh, the degrees of visibility when you talked about representation, being present, and then also being an advocate or activism. And it brings us back to this conversation of whose duty is it to do this work? Is it the, is it the queer person's duty to then become a symbol of progression and to push the community forward by being visible? Right, and then we go about, and then that also speaks to um, the coming out over and over and over again. And then we look to our, let's say, the 50s and 60s, and the sort of intolerance that these gener this generation or the upcoming generations have towards our, our elders. And then was it their duty to push and push or to just survive or to thrive, or to pursue um, uh, uh, the limitations of that time, right? And so, but we, if, if it feels as though, and even, even more so with April's work, we question, well, what is queerness or what makes this queer? Or um, is it the furs or the feathers? Is the reclamation of just existing or, or of existence, right? The celebration of existence or, and of pleasure, right? But whose, whose job is it to then now carry that forward into the public, like taking it into a public space? Is it does that work fall on, uh, on us as elders to continue sleep, strive and push forward? Or is that the job of society to become more tolerant? You know, and I see with work like, um, and what I feel like we've been sort of grazing over is we always come back to this, um, who's, whose identity is it? Is it society's identity, this label of queerness and we are just um, showing up because we have no other choice? Or, or is it something, and I think that April's work really does a really good job of, is this is something that we have, we are, that is continuously evolving and that we have full control over. And so um, there is no liminal uh, sort of queerness or no linear queerness, it just is. And that's so, we, we never really have a, a way of really saying, oh, that's queer, you know? You can, you can conceive something that's never been seen before and you can say, oh, that's queer. Right, so I find it very interesting um, how this, this, this theme sort of comes up as we try and sort of, of dissect the work and then also dissect uh, being queer in the Caribbean region where we know about uh, or we see uh, like the open secret thriving queer um, personalities or identities um, and at, in, in the same space as this stark oppression. And so you say, well, the, the ones, the people who are thriving and have this safe, have space, safe spaces, why are they not doing more? And whose role is that to do more? You know, so that's something that came up. Do any of you like to? Anybody else in the audience? Hi everyone, Camila. Um, I was thinking, fear came up, I think, Peter, you were talking about the notion, and, and Craig, you mentioned also how so many depictions of queerness sort of shield the subject matter in, in one way or another, whether it's, you know, by photographing them from behind or covering the face to protect the identity. But I think while these images feel really bold and that the eyes are looking forward, there's a kind of, I'm hesitant to call it fearless, because I think there's a certain survival, there's a showing up in the face of fear that's required of this demographic. So I feel like to call it fearless, though it is bold, though it is ornate in many ways, I think those things, those elements must persevere as a means of survival. 
So the declaration of I'm here comes with a tension of like, and then what? My initial um, thoughts when thinking about this was about gaze, not just about the context in which the art is being showed, but in the who is watching it and for whom is it? And, and as a black woman, I'm looking at the nails and I'm thinking about adornment as a vehicle to express gender identity, but also just identity in general. <laughs> I think there's a using textiles and the, there's an inherent warmth in, in each of the pieces that is at once reflective of the subject, but also invites the person watching the subject, watching the pieces to become warm, to feel it in one way or another. Like you must engage your warmer self in order to participate um, in the tactility of the pieces. There is a kind of urge to want to touch them, but much like black women's hair, just don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's a kind of, that, that tension exists. You, what you feel like you want to become part of it, it, it is colorful, but this is the safe space in which you're not allowed to touch it. Outside, projected on a wall, somebody walking past it would disrupt the projection. In a poster, it could get vandalized, but here that's not allowed. So the conversation is also caught up in attention, depending on who's looking at it, for how long are they looking at it, what's inside it in them while they're looking at it, how free they feel in the space like this, though it is safe, depending on who's looking, um, and what politics they're still carrying. So I think there is an invitation, but there's also a kind of distance between those who don't yet have the um, liberty, access to the luxury to be the subject and stand in the fear, and those who want to understand and can't because they're also, their survival is also hinged on a sense of identity that is encumbered and not as liberated. Other thought was the notion of Afrofuturism as a, a, offering possibility for liberation, but also um, existing as the only possibility for a certain kind of liberation, like that tension exists where Wakanda, we went to the theater, we all felt like we were part of something. We walked out of the theater, I remember I felt like different <laughs> for sure. And then it wears off because you go into your job and there's a microaggression or you know, you're not paid as much as this person who's not working as hard and they don't look like you. You know, and those things exist. Can you wear your nails like this at work? Will they make a sound when you type? Is someone gonna have a problem with that? In this world, no. But the second you leave these doors, the second you travel anywhere, someone's gonna look at the nails and wonder, you know, well, how do, how do you wipe? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like metaphorically speaking and also like, there's a tension in looking at it as, as an adornment and also as like something that maybe maybe is too much, you know? But we're all a little too much and that's part of the tension too. We can't really sit in it. So anyway, those are my thoughts. <laughs> oh. Just this thought about Antarctica, I find so fascinating. Atlantica, Atlantica, I find so fascinating. No, Atlantica. And so here you have all these figures from the concrete reality of our existence, from the real world. If I imagine that they're transplanted into this Atlantica space, I wonder of the problematics of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's freighted. It's worrisome because, you know, we think of the, you know, it's beautiful, the exhibit. We look at the faces and they're not super radical. They're not militant. They are seeming to inhabit themselves in comfortable ways, you know, to some degree. And smiling, you know, and 
I, I can't see the, the, you know, all of the images. But, you know, I, I wonder about that. I see her as sort of invoking a radical imagination or inviting us into a, into, um, I see it as engendering a radical imagination to think of a time or a space or a place when um, the idea of queerness and what it looks like and smells like and feels like, etc., cetera, um, diffuses, gets, falls away, falls away as an importance, as something of importance. And so I'm wondering, you know, even while we talk about, you know, definitiveness with respect to markers of queerness, I'm wondering if she's not even undoing that concept and thinking that there should be a falling away of, you know, of, of um, markers of queerness. Any more than there should be markers of, you know, cisgender or, or this or that. You know, maybe all these markers just need to fall away, you know? And nobody can look at me and tell me who I am. You know, that's why the, the hands, I think, are clutching it like this. And in, in some instances, they're open, but mostly it's like, oh, they're a black power. Oh, but the fingernails can't do that. So. So it's a modified black power of this. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, just those ideas. I'm wondering whether she's really radical in, in some of the suggestions that I'm reading in this exhibit. I think, I, mean, I think you pick up on something, but I think, you know, it's, it's against all that sort of the balance like we talked about. Do we need all the stories of trauma do we, or do we also just need stories of going out and having coffee? Um, so I think it's sort of like how do you find that balance between um, do, we, do we really need to know if someone, like, do I need to know, aside from that I want to use the correct pronouns on somebody, but do I actually need to know? Not really. You know, I remember one time going into a shop and somebody was serving me and I thought, oh God, what it, huh? and then I thought, actually, why does it matter? I'm just gonna say, thank you. And like, it actually doesn't matter, like at all. I just need to be human and the person to be human back and I don't need to know um, if queer, not queer, non-binary. I just, we just need to interact on a human level. So I think it, it's kind of both, again, is almost having to carry two concepts at once. So I think it's important to have the queer visibility, but at the same time, I think you want to get to the point where it just doesn't matter, which is, I think, what is it is on Atlantica, is that you can exist, and you don't, and again, in April's world, queerness isn't only about, this goes back to the question of, of intimacy and sexuality, right? So her space is about anyone who's been othered, and that otherness is queerness. So whether it's, um, you know, she'll do whole series of, of, of large women, or, um, or simply people of color, right? So again, it, it's, it's any kind of otherness. It's all inclusive. This particular series was done for Nassau, for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and actually originally she also wanted to include portraits of, because she travels a lot in Ghana, but they just really have, the, the laws have been changed there to make it extremely dangerous to portray um, uh, LGBTQ people. So, and, and that then again ties into what Peter was saying about, yes, we're in this country where we have to, there's still work to do um, to have that total acceptance. So I say it to my own kids, I'm like, listen, it's great, be as queer as you want, but please don't hold hands walking down Bay Street, you know, because I, you still have that fear. So yes, we have the work to do, but when, when I think about that we can do this here and we could not do this with the partner gallery in Ghana because these people then would have been arrested makes me then also think, well, maybe we've done some work in this country and maybe we're getting to where we want to go. So yeah, I mean, the nails are both about self-care. So a lot of April's work is also about self-care. And that's what all the plants are for as well, learning how to take time to do something, learning about um, taking time for yourself. But then the fist is, is again, a callback to the Black Power fist, but in a way, as you said, not in a, that sort of aggressive way, but in a in a different way. So so I think you raise, I mean, very interesting points, definitely. Any other questions from the audience? No? No one else? But you know, before we, I, did, I, did, I don't want to start a whole other conversation, but what I was thinking about the queen being the, the head of the church was when you were speaking about the, the, the fabric and how this fabric that is become associated with Africa and it's like you know African pride but is actually a Dutch bastardization the queen is the head of the of, as of the church as well 
um, and how that has been internalized. These ideas, this, this uh, again, about what's evil, what's acceptable, and that, that, that that's something that's become kind of part of us as a society and that we walk around with sort of like ingrained, um, but it's actually not of us. It's something that, that, that was enforced. And so I think the queen also brings that in there as the head of the Anglican church. Um, I'm looking at this, this piece here. I'm looking at all the plants. I'm thinking about the head of the church. I'm thinking of Garden of Eden. I'm thinking of Adam and Eve. I'm thinking of all the ways that uh, the church often, you know, um, you know, with, with just, you, you know, you've, you've heard that, that um, silly phrase, it's not um, Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Eve. Um, I just wondered what you thought about the plants. I wondered what you thought about the possibility that she's rewriting that myth. Uh, I don't know if you had already mentioned anything to do with that. But I find it really interesting. That is true. It, it is a kind of garbage. I mean, I think she is playing with that and this idea of, you know, who's allowed in paradise. But, but again, it is a lot of, the, so plants are portals to Atlantica. So that is actually how you get to Atlantica. <laughs> So the plants are very important because, again, it's, you know, the caring for something, um, having this living organism, learning how to live with it, uh, learning how to care for it. So plants are, in fact, portals to Atlantica. <laughs> no, just caring for them. It's about care. No, caring for them. Um, caring for them. So listen, we could talk about Atlantica has this very complicated mythology. So there's also, so with the nails also refer, because again, a lot of April's work also speaks to um, black fem female empowerment and, eco you know, economic empowerment. And so the nail salon is something that, that ties into that. And then also um, when you're at the nail salon in Atlantica, it's also a travel agency. And while you're having your nails done, uh, they will read your mind, and at the end of your treatment, you will get an itinerary for the vacation you never knew you wanted. But of course, since everyone is wealthy in Atlantica, everyone's got tons of glitter, you can afford your luxury vacation. So it, it's, uh, and, and I think what's also important about Atlantica is that it is something she uses in her daily practice. So it is something that is a means of survival for April as a black woman living on planet Earth. So when she is suffering a microaggression or an, or an outright aggression, let's say she's at the airport getting crap from someone, she will say, in Atlantica, I'd be in the first class lounge, Jesus. You know, so it's actually this kind of active calling of the space, but of creating the space, of willing the space on Earth. Um, so it's not only sort of a fantasy, it's, 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 a, it's a survival mechanism. Thing. I, I think I'm moving away from the art. I'm just wondering, you talk about the, the um, head of the church, Queen Elizabeth, right, the monarch, and any conversation about arriving or, or um, engaging a path toward more progressive thinking, you know, enlarging a consciousness, etc., has to necessarily involve a dismantling of the way we have traditionally seen religion and its role. But that is a conversation that we do not even want to have. You know, people are very reluctant to say anything that sounds blasphemous or sounds, you know, as if you're talking against the church, you know, it breaks up instantly. And so we, we, we never get to really engage in uh, the, the, the different ways in which we might conceive of religion and, and how it hovers over us and how it guides our every step and how it creates cognitive dissonance and how it puts us in a, a, an emotionally very uncomfortable and untenable state of being, you know, but we just, well, you know, that's how it goes. And I think that's a very important conversation. Um, you were talking about the social media thing. I didn't see anything, but one of the um, audios that some prophetess was was spouting, I, I, you know, was able to hear. And I'm wondering, in this day and age, 
I mean, it's just what's happening. It's totally, totally absurd. She should be banned from the airwaves. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I hope it's okay that I talk. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I wanted to bring, um, just from the perspective of somebody else who works in the office, um, but as a queer person who works here, I think that, you know, um, one of the things that we, like, touched on a bit about space and location, as you talked about, Keisha, I think that this space, even, too, is almost, it's on the very private end of the spectrum. So, yeah, it's 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 very safe. Um, and it's safe in a way because it's not, quite made safe for specifically the persons who are represented in this space, if that makes sense. So they are protected by other, they are protected by a system that is not for them, basically, that was not crafted for them. So I think that that's something that we have to acknowledge as well because of the location of our space, the intimacy of our space, and the kind of hidden quality of our space, even on the property and the compound. Um, and I bring this forth because I've had multiple interactions with persons. Um, and also to bring in then too, that these people exist here who are represented in the work, who have their own personal histories, who go about their day-to-day -day life and have communities here. And that then sometimes breaks the fantasy of Atlantica in this space for me, um, where, you know, I had someone come in and he just came to bring me a letter. And then he was like, oh, I know that guy. And I was like, yeah. And he, it was a friend of his and, you know, and then I realized that in that moment by association, then there was a discomfort created between us because he knew someone who I knew was, so then, there's this tension created, and then it's my job to diffuse that, to say, no, this is space, it's, a, it's, it's safe here. I am safe, it's okay. We can exist as equals in this space, you know what I mean? Um, and that diffusion happens both ways, because there was another incident where another guy who works here came into the space, and he looked at the work, and we were talking about the work, and then it broke once again when he recognized someone in the work, and then, the tension then arose, and then it rose, and it rose to then, you know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and, you know, like, walking out of it, and then I was like, okay, um, <laughs> that happened. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, what I'm particularly inter interested in, in April's work existing here, is this idea of protection, this idea of um, anonymity to the persons who would frequent here, being the tourists and stuff, and that layer of protection. Um, but also, when in, when in those spaces, the fantasy of Atlantica breaks, and then how do we repair it um, to then make this space safe again? If that makes sense. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevante. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of like add on to like um, what Dr. Sarah was saying and Jody was saying about, um, I guess like protection and just like this breaking and like, I guess like challenging of like social norms. Um, Cause yeah, I guess like people kind of find it hard to like want to feel safe or to question themselves when there isn't really like, I guess like, safety to do so i was explaining to somebody like the other day um as like a gender fluid as a person like that exists on that non-binary spectrum i was like if a man finds me attractive you're a little queer right <laughs> like if you find a non-binary person as a person that's i guess like cis and i and i also understand the whole like all of these things should not even be a concept but like we want to get to atlantica but we still on earth so we gotta talk about these things we have to talk about these things, right? So I was like, yeah, like if folks, this person finds a person on the non-binary spectrum, like attractive or in that way, like you're a little queer and you kind of have to sit with that. And I was explaining it to them, a cis person that identifies as straight. And he was so uncomfortable. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, because I'm not necessarily someone that identifies as a woman. So 
and I don't necessarily always like how I present myself isn't necessarily always feminine so it's like all of the parts of somebody that is queer visibly and queer presenting all of these things in quotation you kind of have to be like am I attracted to like what the visibility is or the person and like I don't think we have spaces that talk about these sort of nuances and like yeah you have the systems of religion and all these bunch of different things I keep it in these things in place like okay yeah I am perceived as a woman so like I'm not really queer but you kind of are though <laughs> um so yeah I just kind of wanted to add that to the conversation and just kind of like yeah I guess call for it to just like how all of these like concepts just need to be destabilized and questioned and has to be taken like also I guess like outside of these like like private spaces like this as well <laughs> okay. All right. So just to pick up on that, um, I think that we have, uh, for what Kavante was saying, I think we have such a long way to go um, because what you said put me in mind of an experience I had when I visited um, Jamaica um, with a group of friends and we were there to run some workshops. And there were these guys um, who, you know, shuttled us about and took care of us and whatnot. And two of them were very good friends um, from like they were three years old or so. And so during a conversation, random conversation, I said, yeah, he's your intimate friend. And he got very offended. What do you mean, you know? What do you mean intimate? I'm not intimate, we're not intimate. I'm like, of course, you're, he's your, isn't he your very best friend? Like, yeah. Like when you have a bad day or you have issues with your, who do you call? Yeah, who do you talk to? I talked to him and I said, that's intimacy. And so even in terms of thinking about the idea of the ways in which men in particular, black Caribbean men in particular, conceive of how they connect with each other or even how we think about intimacy in only one kind of way, I think, is one of the issues that we have to move beyond, right? It goes back to the idea of, again, when we think about, I think, generally speaking, when most people think about queerness, think about homosexuality, they don't think about a whole person and all that makes up their lives. They think about sex, right? And so when we think about, again, what is queer art for most people, right? It looks a particular way. And I think that that's why it's so important for something like this um, to exist, to be like, yeah, this too, right? And leaves people to sort of struggle with that. Well, what does that mean? How, how, how can I now? How does this um, disrupt the way I think about certain things? And so it goes back to that conversation with this guy, right? Um, and this, this debate went on for like three, four days, right? With me and the, me and the folks who I came with, right? Um, talking about trying to convince him that this is your intimate friend. <laughs> like, you guys are intimate. And him just sort of rejecting it outright initially, right? And then maybe by, before we left, there, there wasn't a concession, but there was a, oh, I understand what you're saying. You know what I mean? But there, 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 that inability to even identify that as men, with however you identify that, you are able to be intimate with another man, or even in terms of what you, what, how you conceive intimacy and what that might mean. Um, we are so limited in the ways that we think about how we express ourselves and how we're able to express ourselves, um, even when we're actually doing it every day, but we're afraid to name it, right? And so I think that. Again, we have a long way to go to sort of get to Atlantica or halfway there. I don't know. Um, one other point, last point I want to make. Um, Ava said something that disturbed me. She said, we as elders. I don't know who, <laughs> who, who you are including in that, in that we. <laughs> I am not amongst that group. Okay? I remember what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, there's a few things I wanted to say, but you know, I forget after that joke. Um, but I think, again, uh, there is an importance in 
having a safe space for yourself, be you queer or not queer, to imagine and to escape your reality because we need that. I think even though we have those microaggressions at work and we have those instances, like you say, when April is at the airport and someone pisses her off and she goes to that safe space, that's mental health wellness, right? And I think for the queer community, this is important because you even see the faces of those who identify as queer. I'm sure they connected. I'm sure this brought them closer as a community, right? And that's one step closer to the Atlantica. And I think we have to hold on to those nuggets with the mindset that what are we doing to contribute to this? You know, we talk about identifying as the advocate, be it the community, identifying as opening up to queer possibilities or queer acceptance, or is it the individual's responsibility? Who is Whose is it? But I think it's all of ours. And I think this moment, this space, these instances, because would this exhibition exist if, for instance, uh, some of the works that were exhibited at the National Art Gallery uh, were accepted in some of the NE exhibitions, right? So it's almost like things had to happen to get to this point. And if we don't allow this moment to uh, prevail and be what it needs to be in order to inspire some of you who are in this space that want to create works, create social media, ex social experience, create writing or whatever it is that you need to do in order to advance the work, then it will be stagnant. Yeah. Instead of saying elders, let's say role models, Craig, okay? <laughs> like role models. <laughs> and I think really that's what it comes down to is, you know, you said who has to do the work. I think, I mean, I would say society. I think we, I think we all do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. space now you have uh craig peter yourself we have um we have this opportunity where now as as pers pe as people who have um as scholars right you are you are the the um esteemed voice or the, or the or the person that we can look to that are you are visible you are in the space um existing right and so you are by de facto the elder Right, because there's no one before you who would have sat in the space. So we're all standing on the work of the people before us, right? And some of those people are nameless, and some of their some of the efforts or the movements are not clearly defined. But a moment like this, April is now an elder, you know, in in this space, you know. So that's what I mean by by elders, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> okay, can you take that now, Craig? You can take that. All right. Yeah, and I, and I think you know when you ask like, who does the work, I think it's. I would actually say people in positions of power have to do the work and they very often don't want to or whatever, but I think those are the people that have to use their influence or their sphere. And I think, but I think everybody, I mean, you know, when my kids are like, oh God, the world's just this most awful place and, you know, it's all going down. I just say, you know, all you've got to do is just do what you can in your immediate circle. Because if everybody just does what they can in their immediate circle, like there's little raindrops in the pond, they're all going, all the circles are going to connect. And so I think that's, to me, that's how I look at it, is that you just have to, in your life, in your practice, do the work. And then hopefully that will connect and create a, a community. Oh, and, and Jody's making the hand signal at me that um, it's, it's time. To, we're going to end right there so i want to say thank you to peter a a bailey craig a smith and keisha no middle initial oliver <laughs> from university of the bahamas for being here this evening and again for all of you for coming it's a wonderful turnout and i'm very pleased so thank you for being here and thank you for the questions and thank you we're so sorry april couldn't join us tonight thank you april for the stunning work and the beautiful space so and thank you jody
Thank you.